I scoured the internet. I sorry I couldn't find this on Akado's website. I Amazoned this one, uh, but um, I found an IoT glove. And um, when you see people walking around like this now, you'll know why they're talking, and it's going to be kind of weird. But I thought I'd share it with you. I thought it was kind of funny and cool at the same time. Uh, but more serious things, I think. Uh, so Consirus, um, yeah, I founded a company, and um, I'll share with you why I founded it. And uh, my grandfather once taught me that if you want to sell something, make it easy to buy. Uh, and this stuff isn't easy to buy, is it? It's like standards and things and Internet of Things and Internet of Everythings. And, uh, and if I hear another connotation of it, I think I'll go mad. Uh, but we tried to uh, box that up as a package uh, for our customers and make it quite simple. So we would work with them, we would consult, we would take them on a journey, and uh, we would create some IoT solutions that solve their problems. So I'm going to share some of those with you today and sort of show you what we've done and how it works and what they got out of it. And you might find it interesting, you might not. Uh, but um, hey-ho, so how do we solve a problem? Well, it is a problem, isn't it? Uh, everybody's waiting for, uh, you know, I was talking to an analyst the other day and I almost said it's a bit like everybody's waiting for the Internet of Things to go live. So on the 23rd of June, it's going to go live. But do you know what? It's live now and it's been live for quite a while. It's the Internet. It's not an industry. It's a technology. And uh, if there are any startups in the room, you know, great, you can get on with it and make money uh, because startups are going to be the ones that make the money uh, and, and they will uh, grow quite quickly and, and get to where we want to go. The other challenge is standards. So uh, I was in China recently and found out that this year there are 2,000 IoT standards. So how the hell are we going to make sense of that lot? Uh, and that's just in China. <clears throat> so I'd love standards and it makes our world and lives much easier in developing applications, but there are literally going to be thousands of them. So how do we work with that and how do we deal with that? Do I need to employ an army of standards people that understand standards? So a uh, little bit about our world. We're about disruption, really, and um, we've been quite controversial with this. So, you know, I hire anarchists and believers. So I want people to break traditional business models and I want them to look at life a little bit differently. So if you're like that and you want to join our revolution, I'm open. Uh, please contact me. <coughs> so <coughs> key things on this slide. I'm not going to do any figures because you've probably been figured to death. <coughs> but the important thing is the top right, uh, is that the Internet of Things changes DNA. And it changes the DNA of everything that you can imagine. <coughs> it means that new style businesses can disrupt traditional models and they can create new models from that disruption. And I'm going to focus on some of that disruption today and tell you a story of uh, a customer that went on a journey with us and how it disrupted their business. So, big one this. Everybody's talking about it, but they're not really doing it. Uh, and so that's my feeling about the market today. I sit in lots of presentations and talk to lots of analysts and they give me the numbers and ask me what I believe and I believe everybody's talking, but I'm going to show you a bit of doing, I guess. So, so the first one is we work with a huge uh, toy truck manufacturer uh, and um, these things are huge, they're bigger than my house actually, and um, they had a particular problem is that they know that uh, oil's expensive, uh, they know that rubber's going to be hard to grow in the future, and they know that producing those tyres are going to be quite hard in the future. So they wanted to elongate the length of the tyre, that was the brief, how do we do that? So we scoured the earth and in Harrisonville in the USA we found a tiny sensor that we can attach to the valve of the tyre, and that valve tells us the pressure and the temperature of the tyre in real time. So we pulled that information with the engine diagnostic information into the cloud of the vehicle and we can now show them on a map where they're driving, how many miles they're driving, what the pressures are on the tyres and we can auto send a guy to go pump it up. Uh, and believe me, that has a direct correlation on energy and fuel consumption uh, and a direct correlation on wear and tear and actually has some health and safety stuff too. 
Uh, but the interesting thing is they're more efficient now because when they lease those vehicles, uh, the, the guy who uh, from Caterpillar would go visit a mine and he would say, you know, how many miles do you do? And the mine operator would say, well, they're working nine to five. And, um, you know, and OK, well, can we throw the tyres in? We'll throw the tyres in. And actually, they're working 24-7 and no one ever pumped them up. And actually, the way the tyres were checked is somebody would physically kick them and they'd go, that kind of feels OK. doesn't need any air, that one. Um, it's quite interesting, but it's changed their world and made them more efficient on how they lease and manage their vehicles. The second one is we work with the US healthcare. In, um, they had a particular challenge, which was Alzheimer's patients. They tend to go walking around and, uh, uh, and lose their memory and terrible illness. Uh, millions of people around the world are affected by that illness. And they had an idea they drew. They wanted us to make them a wristwatch, which was a wearable. <coughs> this isn't meant to be the new iWatch, by the way. It's a medical device. <coughs> but um, essentially, the watch can track you indoors and outdoors down to a foot anywhere in the world. And uh, we put the battery in the strap because it needed to have lots of battery life. It needed to be usable for the wearer. We use e-ink in the screen so they can see it. Uh, we can send their meds and it vibrates and tells them when to take their medicine. So it has all kinds of uses. Another one which you're all going to hate me for, uh, but has come up a little bit uh, in the previous presentation, is around insurance and vehicles. Uh, so we've been working with uh, two of the UK's biggest insurers and we built them an IoT platform. And um, they weren't really interested in how people were driving. So you'll all be aware of things like Insure the Box and Carrot Insurance, where they've been targeting youngsters with telematics uh, and they can see how they're driving and they can manage their risk. So if you're, you know, uh, you know, it's quite interesting that most deaths happen on the road between 18 and 21, happen after 11 p.m. at night on a Friday. So that's the risk zone. Uh, for that demographic and the insurers weren't making profits out of that demographic. So what happened is technology companies found it easier uh, to get into that market and become insurers than the insurers have found it getting into technology uh, which has completely disrupted them. So uh, this particular insurer we work with wanted to understand what happens when there's a crash. So how do we deal with that? Could we use technology to find out whose fault it was? Could we use technology to work out what the damage of the vehicle was? Could we see if there was an injury? So we partnered with the Transport Research Laboratory who have years of data on crash. So they're the institution in Britain that when there's been a smash, they go measure the road and they had years of data. And also when a manufacturer brings out a new vehicle, they test it and they put dummies in it and smash them. And so we take that data up into our cloud. We put some in instruments on the vehicle and uh, we build a picture. So this is a real crash in Nottingham. If any of you know Nottingham, it's a place called Lenton Lane, which is the inner ring road. And this vehicle was doing no miles an hour when it was hit. And you'll see the graph on the top is representing the G-force impact of that vehicle. It was pretty high. So we know there's probably a whiplash injury or a serious injury uh, in this occasion. Uh, the car was pushed about 100 yards down Lenton Lane. So it was a serious impact. And um, so we're now taking weather data from other sources and we're also playing around with Facebook. So was the driver pouring champagne over the head at 3 a.m.? It doesn't mean they were drunk, but it starts to build a picture of what was going on. So the final one is a little story, really. And um, it's one of the first clients we ever worked with about three years ago. <coughs> and uh, they make cable. Quite a, uh, you know, an engineering business in the north of England. They make miles of the stuff. It's not very exciting. But they had an idea to make a smart cable. And the cable, when it got wet, can tell you where on the length it's wet. Or when it gets broken, can tell you where on the length it's broken. And you can think of some cool applications. Landlords could lay it in their screed and know where leaks are in their buildings. Or we can lay it along the railway lines and find thieves when they start ripping it up and causing disruption to our lives. So um, we deployed, the, the, the first brief was, you know, can you connect our cable to the cloud? So, you know, that was quite simple, actually. It's kind of like an M to M thing. We built a little box and we attached it to their cable and we took the data into the cloud. And they sold it as a solution. So <clears throat> rather than their salesperson selling drums of cable, he's now selling a solution that has a reoccurring revenue stream. So the first challenge these guys had is Frank, the cable salesman, couldn't sell this stuff. This is like a new thing. 
And so they went out and hired some solution specialists who now sell connected cable. The second challenge was they came to me and said, Craig, you know, how do you bill this reoccurring stuff? Because Sage can't do it. So we said, well, we've got a billing engine. Maybe we could help you. And we sort of pop that in the cloud and we can send those invoices out. So we helped them. And the final thing was, you know, Craig, um, would you come to a board meeting? Because we've realized now that we're, we're no longer valued at two times uh, 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 trade. You know, we, we, we're valued at 17 times EBITDA, aren't we? And I said, well, guys, you know, um, I don't know about the number of the EBITDA, but the, the truth is you are going to be valued differently if you make this work. So the moral in my story, really, is a traditional small company in the north of England have been completely disrupted by IoT. And it wasn't about the tech, really. We spent more time with these guys, helping them through that journey, than we did building the solution. So my message, really, is that it is really disruptive and it changes the DNA of everything. This company now hire different people, they account in different ways, and they're valued in a different way. And, and so, you know, there's a huge model in turning traditional businesses into this new, this new world, a new way of thinking. Uh, and so, um, you know, I thought I'd share that little journey with you. It's a simple story. But, but, you know, take this into a corporation now. How do you deal with that? When you've got a huge oil tanker and you have this disruption, this disruptive force happening, how do you deal with that? It was quite simple for Thermocable. They employed 30 people. I'll leave you with the, you know, you can solve that one another day, I guess. But we would love to hear from you guys uh, if you uh, have an idea or a concept or you're a corporation and you have a problem, uh, we love to solve them. And um, remember, when you see people walking around like this, maybe you'll remember my little chat to you today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Craig. Loving your gloves, loving your gloves. Um, just kind of coming back to the um, thing about hiring people. Um, you like to hire anarchists. Talk to Indeed. me about that. Why, why anarchists? What, what are you looking for? What are you looking to, to, to break? So um, I think I'm looking for out-of-the-box thinkers, really. Right. I call it anarchy, but it's not anarchy. Anarchy is kind of a bad thing. So if I put a positive spin on my, on my comments. So I want people that are going to look at traditional models and not work a traditional way uh, to solve a problem. Yeah. So we need to look outside of the box. Reinventing uh, almost, not taking things for granted. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the interesting things that we find with IoT is it enables you to do things a different way. And uh, there isn't necessarily an A to Z route. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, we, we have an ethos in Concerus that we, we won't build everything ourselves. Uh, we don't want to own everything. Uh, there are, there are, this, this thing's moving at a rapid pace and we work in partnership uh, on many layers. What we do very well is pull it together uh, and make it a real thing. Uh, and I've been able to share some of those with you guys today, really. Mm. Well, that, that, that certainly, you know, Internet of Things is now. That's certainly been one of the things mm. that we opened with and we're, that we're, we've been seeing over the last few days. And the point that you made there about the business models kind of being one of the things that's changing most fundamentally. And as your example at the end, moving, you know, companies able to move away from a we sell a thing and then we move on to the next customer and try and send it to them. Actually, recurring revenue streams, a kind of service business model. Absolutely. Yeah. Questions, please, ladies and gentlemen. Questions for Craig on any of the uh, stuff we saw on there or about the customers you work with or any of the implementations that, that you have worked on? Yes, we have a question. I Over thought here, I was so going to escape then. Sorry about that. Uh, it's okay. You talked about how it's less the technology and... Oh, okay. uh, you talked about how it's less the technology and more the journey you try and take the client and the customer on, if I got that right. Can you um, unpick a little bit about how you do that because we find that all the time as well? Yeah, certainly. I mean, we, uh, we created a methodology to do that. And um, it's a bit of our secret sauce, really, so I can't share all of it with you. But we, um, we take our customer on a journey, and, um, and that journey starts with, uh, we, we call it our three, uh, three, uh, five Ds. We kind of do this discovery. Can we do it? Is it possible? Can we make it? Uh, and then we sort of uh, develop some prototyping. Uh, you know, is it real? Uh, can, we, can we physically make it? What would it cost to make? <clears throat> and then we actually go into deployment 
and then development, and then and then we go into uh, the discovery of what that's meant to them. So you know, what does that mean now? We've built it; it's working. How are you going to take it to market? What's the impact? Where are the stress points? What do you need to change? How do you need to? You know, it's a it's a huge, and we get a lot of value from that last the last two Ds on our on our sort of circle is where we where we see we add the most value to our customers. <clears throat> but really, you know, the whole thing is a journey, and it's quite an in depth. Uh, these projects I've told you and shown you, you know, they're quite in depth, uh, and I've a team of very bright people. Uh, that write very good software and very good algorithms, uh, and um, I couldn't do any of this without them, really. But it's, you know, it's. It, I'm sharing with you that the value is in the last mile. I think the things at the front end are commoditized already, so clouds are a commodity. You know, I. It's quite funny. I had a, <clears throat> I had a Gartner analyst uh, call me uh, a couple of weeks ago, and and he said, Craig, so tell me, you know. Um, uh, you know, I've interviewed 110 cloud companies in the last two weeks. Tell me how you're different. And it was almost like, you know, the guy had given up. Yeah. He'd just given up on cloud. Uh, you know, it's just a commodity. It's already commoditized. And so we, we see the world a little differently.